So hello, uh, thanks for attending or listening to this talk on our Becker alignment jig. My name is Sean McHill. I'm the clinical director of education for Becker, and this is Roger Brock. He's our uh, senior technical advisor. Um, we both are often here at Becker CFAB if you need any help or support. Um, today, we are uh, joining a customer online to help discuss how to set up the Becker um, fabrication jig, uh, alignment jig, um, and to how to problem solve and customize that to your needs. Uh, specifically, there were questions about uh, for prosthetic socket use with uh, calf or excuse me, thigh uh, corset and how to align the knee joints. We're going to cover that as well, too, but we're going to start really at the basics and move on to those further adaptations. So um, we've got a KFO model here in our jig today and hopefully a couple views for you that you can see uh, appropriately, but uh, we'll move the camera around as needed and uh, hopefully help you out. So Roger, you wanna go ahead and begin and let us know how we're gonna initially approach the alignment. Yeah, certainly. Um, the first thing is to have the mandrel and the mandrel obviously inserted into the mold. Um, what we use here at Becker Orthopedic is going to be basically a half inch gas pipe. Um, one of the most important things that I find about it is, is that uh, from the level of the plaster, to the end of the workstation, you want to have in the area of eight to eight and a half inches so that you can lock it down properly and, and get it in. Um, the, the distance between the top of the mold and the T um, means quite a bit. Um, in this case, we have, um, I have a hole that is giving us the exact alignment of where this patient is going to need their knee center. Um, Sean, do you want to explain the hole? Yeah, it's just in our habit in central fab is to um, align the toe out position that is requested by our customers and looks most appropriate to the mold, if, if not specified. Uh, set the depth at a 60-40 ratio for most standard knee joints. It's further posterior, uh, five eighths more for uh, posterior offset style knee joint. Uh, it may be inferior or superior in a polycentric knee joint uh, because the axis of rotation will be in the, the center of those two uh, screw holes. So that's plus or minus a half an inch as well. Um, we drill a three eighths inch hole uh, standard into our cast and insert that rod prior to pouring so that the alignment throughout the process is going to be maintained when our um, technicians are then bending the uprights to the mouth. Okay. Um, once that's done, I have everything uh, basically loose on the workstation at the moment. Everything is, is not tightened down. Once I put the mold in, I also do not tighten that down. I'm going to insert the rod that we use into the mold for alignment. It has some sleeves along with it um, to make up for that 3 8 inch diameter. The rod itself is quarter inch. Um, the reason it's quarter inch is because the handles, the whole diameter is a quarter inch. So as we set up, get my mold locked down. I can pull this into place. I loosen this. Now we have articulation in many different directions up and down and so forth. So I can go up, I can go down. Um, so basically what I am attempting to do is get that rod through those holes on each side. And there. Once I have the rod installed in there, now I can start to tighten things down. We know if I tighten this T-handle down, the mold is going to cant. So, because these are all loose at the moment, it's okay. So we'll make this tight. That's nice and tight. <laughs> now, we uh, once we tighten that down, our external rotation and our knee center height is going to be good at the next point, I'm going to tighten down the length to the knee center. And then lastly, I'll tighten down the rotation. 
So Roger, a couple of special circumstances here in case like the depth is much farther down. Now, obviously we can still go down here uh, mm -hmm. in articulation, but what if you get to a point where, uh, is there further extension needs ever or? The, we've manipulated a, a couple of different fixtures on our own where, where basically it would become not unlike uh, um, like a growth adjustment uh -huh. that attached to this point and went down. We've we've done that in the past to um, so it would have a quarter inch screw hole and then a slide. So that would, that, would be maybe some special circumstances, but for the most part, there's enough length in this upright and in these drop downs here that should accommodate almost all. Yeah, when you run into a couple of different situations, if I had pulled the plastic and I had the seam here. Yeah. I would want to cut out the area right there so that I have freedom of movement. Okay. Yeah. Um, that works out really well for me. All right. Um, so now, just basically. All right. So we've, we've, been, uh, we've set our alignments. We've locked in now all of the different T handle spots. Yes. Okay. So now we have to also lock in our mandrel position first. Yes. Our, we are um, locked in. Some people will put a wedge in there. Okay. In the back. Um, I don't find that um, necessary yep. all the time. Um, it depends on how strong your mandrel is. If your mandrel was really weak, um, basically we would take a, a metal wedge yep. and we would drive it in between the mandrel and the fixture right here, yep. just to make sure that it's nice and tight. Well, and we all know sometimes we get a little short piped when we filling a cast exactly. and those things happen. So. That's just how we make sure we're stabilized. The mold's not going to move. It's going to be locked in. Your alignment has been set and established. Now, that's in the case where we were able to do the rod. In the case where you're doing a below knee prosthesis with a, with a corset, um, we got to think about how do we do that differently when we can't drill a rod through our mold? There's going to be a couple of different things. So uh, basically what we have to do is have an identifying marker uh -huh. and a distance from that marker to what we're going to consider to be the articulation set. Okay. Okay. So once we've identified that and, and put the marker on, I would then build out um, a mild wedge. Uh, a lot of times uh, uh, just a piece of wood or something that would go up against this rod uh -huh. where it would meet up in distance from that identifying marker to the articulation center. Okay. Is that, uh, I wonder if that's clear enough. I, I think we also use this too, right? For the. This is possible to use. A lot of times when uh, folks do not um, put a hole through their mold. Yep. Um, this is basically a pointer. Right. Um, and that can go directly into the arm. Yep. In this manner, if I had marked um, a lot of times with China marker and so forth, yep. um, then that would be a pointer that I could point. There are two that come with the workstation, so you just get them both to point to the center of your marks. That allows you then to establish the same height, the same rotation for each of the tools on each side of the leg. Uh, so in the circumstance like a below knee prosthesis where you can't drill that rod through it, but you still need to be aligning to the same point. You're going to make sure that the marks are uh, at the same depth and position and reference on the model first, and then use this to further validate the the alignment or um, collinear position between the two sides of your tool then. So, exactly. Okay. Um, a couple of nice things to do um, too is uh, up at the top of the uh, jig where it's male and it's female, um, especially when you're doing uh, joints and corset and you don't have the mold to work from. If I wrap a piece of tape around here, once I've identified exactly where I want it to go, mm -hmm. then that tape continues to tell me throughout the process that I'm where I need to be. Okay. Another pro tip there. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add our knee joint. Um, there's a on the arm itself. There's two different views. Let's see if I can show this properly. We see this where where it's got a step down and it has a slide. Uh -huh. um, the intent of that in the end was so that that slide meets up with your joint so that your joint can't move 
Yep. Can we see that? Yep. All right. Let's switch screens here just to make sure we're getting the right uh, view for everybody watching at home. <laughs> I can't do that actually. All right. Well, I'll keep going. Okay. Um, in most cases, uh, we don't use that here. Um, I use the back side of it or the flat side. Um, the reason that I do that is, is because I didn't necessarily, we center our mandrels, but each mandrel, the, the mold itself might be several degrees from actually straight. Okay. All right. Um, so I find this uh, operation to just be time, more time consuming, not necessarily bad, but more time consuming. Okay. So that helps you also to get the knee joint closer to the mold too. Exactly. Uh, versus behind the behind the fixture so exactly um that's also another reason i think we do that right yeah yes um so if i was doing this and this was plastic a lot of times if i'm using um 3 16th plastic quarter inch plastic the plastic itself is my identifying marker of my distance from knee center yeah. um, and your your offset of your joint casting so you're going to try to fit that joint casting as close to the mold as possible for us but it, we may have additional offset, like in the case where we're using a ring lock. But in a free motion joint, we're going to try to set that offset no farther away or directly on your plastic or your laminate so that the, the joint isn't offset away from that any more than the material thickness that you're working around. Okay, so now um, we're going to talk about mounting the joints to the arm. Sure. Um, we have a couple of different... Um, Red styles and T handles that come with the workstation. Um, these are set up for Becker orthopedic style joints. Um, so the large one is a 5 16 24 red. The small one is a 10 32 thread. That isn't always um, work with the Autobach type joints and so forth like that. But when you look at that, um, whatever millimeter that they're having, whether it's a four millimeter or six millimeter um, screw, I still use, I, I just go purchase those screws from a home store and I could put those screws through the handle and into the bushing that exists in the knee joint. Okay. All right. Longer, longer bolt or screw that can reach. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so once once it's on there, the joint goes behind it yep. and just into it. I know we've we've customized some tools for ourselves too that have a longer length and depth. Sometimes you need to do that for a varus or valgus knee position, exactly, um, or or different different joints again being used in the field uh, that a customer may send to us. So. We have uh, we have a joint. Um, some of the joints have. Uh, things on the outside of it, like the LR9002 yep. comes with a spring and a spring housing that's on the outside of the joint. Um, so we've made up a couple of different handles for ourselves that would be longer right? so, so that we could shim around those you can see, different instances. Yeah, no, this is like what is stock and comes with the uh, fabrication kit. Uh, and then that's like a custom one we've made in house here to accommodate some special needs uh, devices. So, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and set the knee joints up on the mold at the moment. Yeah, great. Um, so basically, let's see, what I'm doing here is just centering the whole Face down. Can you see that, or am I in the wrong spot? Um, I think we're we're. You gotta just show it. Uh, there okay. you go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so here we're tightening the T handle down to the the holding tool. We you call this again uh, uh, the the handle. The handle. Okay. Yeah. And uh, um, so that doesn't have to be severely tight. A lot of people are are breaking them because they're really wrenching them down. Yep. Um, that doesn't necessarily need to be extremely tight. One of the um, next tricks that you can do is if you have a marker. It's always at the bottom of the door. Yeah. If we have a marker, once we set it, 
where we want it and we align it onto the mold. Now I just make an identifying mark across the joint itself with the marker to tell me that if this joint was to rotate or shift, that I've shifted and I just need to return to that area. If you want to you want to give yourself a reference point of how you lock that T handle onto the holding tool and then um, just be mindful as you're bending that if you get that loose or you rotate it at all, you want to be able to return it. So all right, you want to attach that one too. We'll yep. do the same thing. Okay. Since we have a view of this medial side and the lateral side on the other camera. Um gonna give you both there. Well, this mold doesn't have a lot of flexion in it, but we're going to talk a little bit how to deal with flexion too um, in the alignment position. There are periods in time when the mold is in flexion, but they don't want the flexion in there. Right. Um, and there's also times when obviously the, the flexion exists and is necessary. Right. So you got to think about or know what the fabrication instructions are and whether we're going to accommodate that flexion or we're going to build to um build it out of the, the mold so without doing a cast correction you can correct it in the bending process yes yeah so um at this point um we would we would center our mold um center our bar on the mold if this joint was in flexion and the flexion was necessary for the patient because this is a 1002 not necessarily if it was 1006 you handle it differently no yep. but i would deflect the bar to meet the angle that's required yep. before I bend any offsets. Right, and in more severe flexion cases, we're gonna bend an equal amount of flexion in the distal and the proximal bar. Yes, yes. Um, that is something that yeah, people don't know this, but you can also order your uprights from Becker Orthopedic Manufacturing with a prescribed amount of flexion already deflected into the bars. If you call our manufacturing, uh, department they'll they'll help do that they'll put an equal amount of the flexion into the two bars for you um, that helps when when you're standing a patient up that the joint casting will be more vertical and it prevents then uh, load issues and more better surface bearing area across the joint uh, body if if it's if you're adding the flexion into the bar and your sagittal alignment is more vertical of the joint itself okay if this joint or if this mold was in knee flexion and that flexion was not required, yep. um, we wanted that patient to come to full extension. Right. Um, basically, what I would do then is I would I would center the proximal bar. I would make my contours yep. on both sides. At that point, I have my ML established because the bars are coming there. Yep. Again, I would use the marker to mark here on both sides where that ml is yep then i would rotate the bar to meet the distal end at the flexion that the mold is uh -huh. and contour that when once it's cut off and the and the plastic is removed from the mold it will come to 180 degrees because the joint comes to 180 right. degrees so we call that swinging uh the bar and you of course you switch the the alignment but kept the joint in the fully extended position as he did that so it's meeting its extension spot um, and what you just want to be careful there too is that you're doing it equally on both sides yes uh, so that as you're doing that the um, there'll be less squaring process for you at the end uh, when you finally assemble it all together yeah uh, our habit of, of course is to uh, correct the mold into uh, the alignment that's desired uh, prior to pulling it, but certainly swinging uh, can occur if uh, if necessary or that wasn't done in the original uh, creating of the mold to begin with. Yes. Um, one more thing that um, I want to mention, if we have a double upright and um, we're, we're bending it, one of the things that I do like to make sure of on my molds is that I would bring this arm onto here to identify that my joints are parallel with one another when I do that. Yeah, so that's a good point too, especially when you don't have the alignment rod and you're using those reference points. A good way to check that you have good symmetry 
on your alignments because you know you have symmetry in terms of depth, in terms of height, but in terms of that sagittal plane um, flexion extension, that's what aligns that for you by bringing the alignment tool from the one side onto the other side, uh, putting a square across or or using, we use our eyes the, um, for the most part across that joint casting, but you can be a little more objective by putting a, a level or a square across there too. And that helps you to make sure you've got good uh, parallel alignment there. So especially important in, in the case where you don't have that alignment rod to ensure um, the connection between the two sides. Exactly. Um, so once I had that established, I would, in general, I would do my cutoffs and my obviously cut the bar to the desired length that you want prior to bending. Um, do your deflections prior to bending. Yep. Once that's all established, I, I would contour it at this point. Yep. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of different varieties of things that um, folks like to do that is is their type of uh, technical work, and that's great. Um, when I get done with this. And I have it contoured. I, I personally, I, I put um, Chicago screws into the plastic. So yeah. I drill my holes. I mark my holes. I drill my holes while it sets on the mold. Yeah. One thing that we didn't uh, mention too is if before we're swinging, we always will um, drill the holes in the proximal section after it's bent, um, and then we do the swinging. So that also makes assures that. Uh, as you as you uh, reattach that, that you're going to get back into that same position on the on the plastic that you were at when you were uh, bending it. So mm -hmm. the holes get drilled prior to doing the swing. Um, you've marked your your tool along the horizontal bar for where this attaches to the offset that after you've bent these, and then you're going to uh, swing it and do the bending distally. Um, any final cuts uh, and alignment to an ankle joint if you're doing that, or a final cut at the bottom, um, and then drill those holes if you're having to swing the the joints. So it's just that order of operations is really important so that now you take the bars off, you're going to be screwing it all together. You want to have that full extension alignment. Again, all trying to minimize the need for a lot of um, squaring post assembly. Uh, we just want to be able to do some minor tweaks and make sure that we're squared off in our in our joints once we're done. There are a couple of uh, different things that I, I remind people of. Um, the the fixture always is going to remain square. Your your mold itself, uh, once it's solidified, it remains the way that it is. Um, plastic plastic has a tendency from time to time to move. Uh -huh. um, it opens, it closes, it does different things. If we know that the plastic was at a point and the knee joints were square to that plastic, when when we pull it off, if it opens up, I know that I can bring those joints back in to square. And that's where you might want to do a little bit of heat on the inside to reset your plastic. Yep. Our our tendency again there too is once we if we're bending on the outside of the shells, we have those shells on there, but we've also uh taped them into position. We've uh, done our cut off. And we've we've done our cutoff, we've done our finishing of the plastic. Uh it we've reassured that it's fitting the model well. Um, if need be, we heat it a little internally and then tape it onto the model prior to the bending process. So again, trying to minimize any of those issues that might affect a square uh, position or the final joint position. Yeah, of course, you find that a lot with liners uh, more often than you would with just the plastic or, or you know, just making sure that it's solidified. It's cool. Sure. All right. So I think that really covers most of the um, fabrication alignment jig uh tools is there anything else you think we may need to mention here roger uh, we didn't talk about uh the the bending iron um this is one made <laughs> attachment spot oh, that's why we didn't do that yeah <laughs> um now i forget what what is unique to becker cfab and uh whatnot but uh always good to be having a, a stable um uh bending iron spot uh one that maybe is on the side 
of, of your model that you're working on, and then you can bend with and then switch to the other side. So we've got a little homemade uh, jig that holds our bending iron. It's on the opposite side there. And then we also use a vise um, uh, with a bending iron that's static to us and then have another iron. Um, a nice place to hang a bending iron um, when you're when you're working with the Becker jigs too is you can always store or hang a hang a um, bending iron right there. Um, it's a nice helpful spot. We tend to use uh, you know crescent wrenches holding the joint castings themselves. Another nice tool to have around you when you're when you're using the alignment jig. So um, great. So appreciate that, Roger, and your expert advice there. Um, Thanks for joining us today. Uh, th uh, please call uh, Becker if you have any questions about using our alignment jig, and uh, thanks for your support. Have a nice day. Thank you. All right. Hey. <laughs> Cut the action, but uh, any questions we can help address for you that maybe we we didn't cover? or um, Obviously, I can send you this recording, too, and if that's helpful to share with your team, happy to do so. Yeah, I think if I could get the recording, that would be great, so I can show them when they yep. have some time. Um, yeah, that was helpful. I think cool. we are going to have to modify our T handles. Because the yep. issue yeah. we're running into is their threads aren't long enough. Yeah, um, so what we did on, on this, a lot of times uh, you can use just like uh, uh, Allen bolt or anything that is, is going to tighten, right? Um, mm -hmm. On this, I just took some bolts. I trimmed off the head. I had the T handle of my selection and mm -hmm. inserted it into the hole and put a small rivet through it. Sorry, let me. So he just okay. he basically made his own version with you know drilling out and pulling. You we also can use just like a long bolt that has a Allen head exactly. in it too, you know. Mm -hmm. So just gotta yeah. figure out some lengths for you. We we've got a bunch of homemade tools that we work with. Yeah. Uh, like like this is this is that homemade tool we use for holding the uh, holding your your uh, bending, bending iron in. Yeah. And that, the nice part about that is then we got you know we do this we we bend here and you just you just take it off, do a couple of bends, and then you're right mm -hmm. back. I don't have to hold with two hands. I can hold the bars in one hand, hold this in the other. You can do the same thing obviously with the vice too. But this just is a quick operation to move from one side to the other side. So uh, mm -hmm. probably a part that we should offer and make customers do. But yeah, uh, yeah. considering I'm assuming it, this is here. It did come with a, a bar there that has a bunch of um Yeah, we, dollars we have the it. we have the floor floor mount uh, and it does have that on the side of it with a bunch of different yeah. options. Yeah. So what I did was I, I literally took that bar that it came with mm -hmm. and I cut it off. I cut off the, I took out the pins. I cut it off. I put on a vacuum plate. This is literally the end that I cut off from here, mm -hmm. bolted it on and then put a face plate on it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, take a little closer yeah. look. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the longer uh, okay. version of this. Uh, yeah. meeting so you can see that so if you decide you want to do something similar you know how to do it but uh -huh. uh, you know feel free to reach out if you got other questions uh, hopefully that helps for you I mean I think once you learn learn like the 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 motor habit of setting this up and and doing it in that particular order is really important yeah but once you get that order down it's it's a quick process yeah right? it's a matter of repetition there I think um, one so I haven't done many. Uh, my coworker has in the past, but he hasn't laminated like we do here. So that's something I'm messing around with and trying to yeah. figure out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the hard part is you don't have the rod to start with that can go through the middle. So you got to you got to do the uh, you got to make sure yeah. you're at the same point on both sides. And that mm -hmm. that's a challenge, although, you know, the depth will be you just make sure you're set up at the same depth on both sides, which that assures you're set up in the coronal plane because of how the bar rotates. 
So now it's just really that that uh, sagittal plane assurance, and that's where taking the one side off, putting it on the other side, making sure your bars are parallel to each other will solve that for you. So yeah, okay. that that definitely helps because that was the one the one issue we had with this one we previously made. Yeah. They weren't quite parallel. So, yeah. but that that was a good tip. So. I'll do that. What's really nice about this too is if you had, if I was doing joints and torset and I was in the position that you're in, um, there's a good chance that I can use this as a drill guide. Okay. Mm -hmm. If the mold was not there, I could use this for a drill guide. If we had an extension on the bottom, say pendulum foam, something that I can knock off easily later on, mm -hmm. I can put my mold in, get the correct rotation, lock it down, use these for a drill guide, come through with a hole, and now the pendulum foam reacts as the knee. Then I just knock that off and put on whatever goes on there mm. the next point. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That's what he was describing with the wood block thing. Exactly. Too, right. So you could you you can you can create yourself an external hole, but it, it may affect your joint offset. You're trying to get those joints like touching that socket, right? Like as kind of as yeah. close as you can. Well, it, it so. depends on well, that's that's the other challenge. It just depends on the patient. And yeah, yeah, so. yeah. It's hard to have process when there's so many people that are so different from one another, right? Exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, and yeah. We we've gone like I don't know what's going on, but we we haven't really gotten many in the past. But now all of a sudden, yeah, they're, they're just showing up uh, a bunch. Yeah. So. Oh, that's good. A good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, huh? fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, interested to hear how it all works out for you. Feel free to reach back out to us. Thanks for your time today. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, good luck to you in this. So, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all. Yeah, man. Yeah, be thank well. You. Take care.